I, I just want to kind of tell you my story. I, um, I, I first of all feel really uh, kind of unworthy. Um, I have made many mistakes in life and plenty of bad choices, and I realize this, uh, this story isn't about uh, me. It's what God's done in my life and what he's done through our family's life. Um, so that, that's, I'm glad to be here to do that. Uh, I, I grew up in the church. Uh, I was really lucky. I had a mom and dad that were together. My dad was a uh, minister of music at a Baptist church uh, in San Antonio. My mom was the church pianist. And we grew up in church and in music. And I've got a lot of great memories of uh, growing up as a family of, a, of the staff uh, at church. And uh, I really don't have any bad memories, quite honestly, until about the age of 12. At the age of 12, um, my uh, parents told me they were getting divorced. And that, at that time, was the biggest shock of my life. I was not expecting that at all. I had never seen them fight or argue. Um, total surprise. Um, and what happens next in a lot of divorces is a custody fight. And um, that, that got pretty nasty, and we basically bounced from mom to dad. And that went on for about a year. And when I was 13, about a year later, um, my dad had gone out of town for the weekend. And we were staying with some friends. And it was a Saturday night. and. Uh, my mom was found uh, murdered. She, um, she had been shot at close range three times in the face. Um, her clothes had been ripped off of her, and she was found um, uh, naked in the backseat floorboard of her car. Um, she was shot at such close range. She was a very attractive lady, and uh, that, that was ruined. And so we had to have a closed casket funeral uh, because it, it just didn't look like her. Uh, we were scared to death. Uh, I'll tell you right then, uh, for, for a 13-year-old boy, for his mother to be found, uh, well, the police said it looked like a, a rape and robbery that had gone bad. And her purse was found in a, a nearby lake. But uh, the impact on a 13-year-old boy to have his mother found naked and for everybody to know about it just had a, a big impact. Uh, and I, I picked up bags of fear and anger and, and, uh, and, and hurt. Um, but we got to the funeral, and we were living with my dad, and life was somewhat getting back to normal, if you will, for about a year. And... A, about a year later, when I was 14, uh, my dad also had a construction business on the side. But uh, about a year later, when I was 14, uh, he and two of his employees uh, were arrested for uh, the murder of my mom. Uh, he was charged with uh, capital murder and criminal solicitation for hiring these two men to, uh, to do what they did to my mom. And uh, that <laughs> was another big shock in my life. I will tell you, my brothers and I felt like we had lost our family. Um, we went to move in with an aunt and uncle in Austin, and I started high school. And, uh, but my dad maintained he was innocent, and I believed him. And uh, it was a circumstantial case. The only evidence was basically the, the, the two other men involved. One said the other guy did it. And that guy said the other guy did it. And one said he overheard my dad hiring the other. That was it, as well as some life insurance that my dad had taken out on, on my mom. That was the only evidence. So it took a couple years before it went to trial. Uh, I was 16, uh, middle of high school, and it finally went to trial. Trial lasted about, uh, about three months, I guess. And he was found guilty of, my dad was found guilty of capital murder and criminal solicitation and uh, the jury awarded him the death penalty. And so when I was 16, my dad headed off to death row in Huntsville. Still maintained he was innocent. Um, soon after that, my brothers and I uh, moved to God's country to Malvern, Arkansas. <laughs> Is that right? And uh, moved in with my grandparents and finally had somewhat of a normal life. I then went to... Uh, 
uh, another Christian institution, the University of Arkansas, and uh, uh, graduated from college there. But about my senior year in college, um, and right before that, that's when I finally had become a Christian. I had walked the aisle as a child uh, in the Baptist church, but I just wasn't sure, and I finally got it settled when I was uh, 19 in, in college and became a Christian then. But um, that senior year in college, the district attorney's secretary in my dad's case came forward, and she said, I've got to make a confession. She said, there are some men on death row that shouldn't be there. And she confessed that the district attorney had altered some evidence in my dad's case um, and made up some evidence because he was convinced he was guilty, but he couldn't prove it. Um, the Court of Criminal Appeals awarded my dad a new trial. I was so excited. That just reinforced in my mind that uh, my dad was innocent. I, you know, we had kept the faith that he was, uh, he was innocent and was going to get released. Um, I graduated college. Marilyn and I got married when I was 22. We moved to Austin, Texas. My dad lived in, uh, at the time was in the, back in the San Antonio County Jail, and I saw him all the time. I had a great relationship with him. We visited quite a bit. Um, again, he maintained his innocence. It took a couple of years before he went to trial, and uh, I guess I was about 24, something like that, and um, I was testifying for my dad. My brothers and I were all going to testify for him. And, but what happens if you are a witness in a murder trial, you can't actually attend the whole trial. You can only testify your part, and then you have to leave. And in my life, and this is true with a lot of murder victims, uh, family members, is I became obsessed. I wanted to know what happened to my mom, who did it, who was involved. I want to know every detail of her death. I, I will tell you, I grabbed the big suitcase of obsession. Uh, I just couldn't let it go. And um, finally, went. So, so what Marilyn did is she actually would take notes for me every day in the courtroom because I couldn't attend. And where we were staying in the evening, I would, I would go through the notes and trying to figure out what happened to my mom. I just had to know the details. The trial lasted about a month, and I testified for my dad, which was also uh, kind of difficult because what happens is it's one thing to be a victim's kid. It is totally different to be an offender's kid. Uh, people treat you differently. Uh, we were not treated very kindly um, by the police or the district attorney. Um, just friends, teachers, it, it, we just got treated differently when you're a kid of an inmate. Um, but he finally went to, went to trial, it lasted about a month, it was, um, it went to the jury, and 11, the first vote, 11 people voted not guilty, but one guy, he said he was guilty. That went on for three days. And basically, that one guy was able to talk the rest of the jury into going ahead and finding my dad guilty of a lesser charge. Uh, they found him guilty of murder instead of capital murder. And I gave him a life sentence, but he was eligible for parole within the week. I, I have to tell you, I was, uh, I don't know if excited is the right word, I was glad that my dad was getting out. I wasn't glad he got convicted, but I was glad that he was going to get out of jail. We, I had actually testified that he could come live with Marilyn and I when he got out of jail. I was so ready for him to get out. Um, but that night, after his conviction, he was, again, about to be released within a week or so, uh, I had a list of questions. Marilyn had taken a bunch of notes, and I just had some questions. And it wasn't about my dad. It was more about my mom's death and some other, other people in the situation. And so Marilyn and I went to the county jail that night to talked to my dad, and, and we were kind of excited he was going to get out, and I had my list of questions. I'm kind of an organized guy, and I had my questions, and I was ready to get them answered, and uh, we started going through it, and just in just a few minutes, my dad finally said, Jim, I did it, and she deserved it. I couldn't believe it. I, I, was, I was shocked. <laughs> uh, and let me tell you then, that is when I picked up the bag of betrayal. He had lied to me all those years. I had supported him, and um, our family had supported him, and I just couldn't believe it. And what I also couldn't believe is he wasn't sorry. He wasn't sorry at all about it. In fact, he blamed her. 
he felt like he was the victim, not her, my mom. Um, I'd like to say that I responded in a Baptist way, but I did not. <laughs> I was pretty angry and uh, furious, probably is a better word. And I told my dad right then, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you spend the rest of your life in prison. That's what the jury gave you. I'm going to do all I can. Um, Lewis and I, my brother, were not raised nicely by the media at all. You know, it's one thing when you testify for your dad that killed your mom, they just don't treat you nicely. And um, we reached out to them. And uh, I told the media that my dad had confessed. He was not sorry. And I wanted people of San Antonio to please write letters of protest because I wanted to keep my dad in prison. I'll be honest, I wanted him to rot in prison. Uh, fortunately, everybody wrote letters and parole was denied. And this time, my dad had to go back to Ellis Unit in Huntsville. Only thing that was different, though, is he had been on death row for all those years. And on death row, you are protected. You are isolated. It's actually a safe place to be. This time, he was going back to Ellis Unit general population uh, with all of the uh, hardened criminals of society. I mean, we're talking the murderers, rapists, the hardcore stuff. And he was facing life. And I was excited. That's exactly where he needed to be. And I told him, um, as well as my brothers, we said, you will never see us again. We are going to protest your, your release from parole forever. You are life in prison. Uh, the next year, we actually moved here and joined this church. Uh, and uh, the following year, Bryce was born. And I noticed something pretty quickly um, after I had my own son that I was just like my dad. I was just like him. I acted like him. I responded like him. I had a lot of the same attitudes like him. Um, and I didn't, it wasn't until I had a, a normal family with Marilyn and her parents that I realized what normal was and uh, quickly realized that uh, my dad was pretty abusive, uh, Lewis and I would say. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. But, um, I was scared to death. How in the world did my dad go from a happily married man with three kids and a minister of music at a Baptist church to a killer? I couldn't figure that out. We also found out at that second trial that my dad not only had hired these two men to kill my mom, he had hired them to kill myself and my two brothers. I wanted him to rot in jail but it scared me to death. I was just like him. <laughs> and I knew if I didn't figure, figure it out, my son was going to be just like me. We have such an impact on our kids. It's incredible. Um, about three years went by, and I had no contact with my dad at all. We had completely cut him off. And um, I decided I was going to go see him one more time. I was going to tell him that uh, I had had a son, uh, that Marilyn and I had had a son. It's not just my son. <laughs> Our son. And uh, my brother had had some kids and that he was never going to see them because you know what? My mom was never going to see them and that was because of him. And I didn't want him to see ours. Um, but I had a list of questions. <laughs> I wanted my questions answered. And uh, so I, I went. And, the, when I, and I was a little scared because, again, um, on death row, it was isolated. We actually would visit with a glass and a phone on each side, so there was no contact with my dad. But now, since he was in general population, uh, it was contact. And again, I was not excited. He had tried to, he, he'd killed my mom, and he wanted to, had, tried, had hired some men to kill us. But how it was set up, it was outside at Huntsville, and there was kind of like a picnic table, and he was sitting on one side, and I walked up and sat down. And when I sat down, I just knew something was different as soon as I saw him. And I had my list of questions, and immediately he said, Jim, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I'm sorry for what I did to your brothers, and I'm sorry for what I did to your mom. And I was taken aback, because this was a guy who never said he was sorry, ever. In fact, he was always right. You know, people like that. 
I'm like that sometimes. But uh, he was always right, you know. Um, but I listened to him because he answered all my questions. And he told me right then uh, that in those last three years, he had hit rock bottom, that he had lost all of his family, all of his friends. Um, you know, even, even my mom's mom, before he confessed, thought my dad didn't do it. I mean, there, he had a lot of support. Um, but he told me right then that he had hit rock bottom, and he had finally accepted Jesus Christ into his life and had become a Christian. And I wish I could tell you I believed him, but I didn't. I thought, oh, it's a jailhouse conversion. You hear about these all the time. I didn't think it was sincere at all. But he answered all my questions. I, I left the visit that day, and I, I called Marilyn and my brothers, and let's just say they didn't believe him either. <laughs> Less so than I did. Because uh, uh, I, I am sure, not to speak for Lewis, but he had plenty of bags of hurt and betrayal and uh, shame, just like I did. And he was not trusting of my dad. But something made me keep going back. And so for the next year, about once a month, I would visit with my dad, and he would explain to me how, how he went from happily married guy to a killer. And for him, it was choices. It's, it, it basically started out with, he started hanging out with the wrong group, you know. Uh, Marilyn always says, uh, bad company corrupts good character. And that was no exception with my dad. He started hanging out with the wrong crowd, started going to happy hours and, and drinking late, and came home to my mom and, and, my, and my brothers and I, and he was drunk and had spent all the money. And uh, next thing he did is he had an affair. He had an affair with the secretary of this construction business. My mom had caught him. She still tried to stay in the marriage to work it out. But then the next step he took, another bad choice, is they got in a fight and he hit her. And she did the right thing. She said, I'm leaving you. She had put up with everything else, but when he hit her, she, he had crossed the line. And my dad couldn't believe that she would leave him. <laughs> Incredible. Next thing, he's uh, having custody fights, and he's in a bar, and, and you've got to be careful what you say. You know, it's one thing to think something but once you say something, it takes a life of, his own, of its own. And he said, I wish she was dead. The next thing, he's in a bar with two men, and he's hiring them to kill my mom. The next thing, he's like, you know what? I just want to be free. I'll kill them all. And next step was greed. And he said, I'll take a bunch of life insurance out. Um, so I learned what led him down that path. And I'd been visiting for about a year, and finally I got a call. And the, the chaplain said, Jim, you've got to get down to prison. Uh, something's happened to your dad. I called my brothers, and they said, no way. <laughs> Finally, one brother said, I'll go with you, but I don't want to see him. So we raced, raced down to Huntsville, and uh, the chaplain said, your dad's had a brain aneurysm. It's a blood vessel that pops in your brain. And, and he had been rushed to the Galveston Hospital. So uh, my brother and I head down to Galveston, and my dad had uh, been taken by helicopter to Galveston from Huntsville, and he had died en route. Um, and when we got there, he was brain dead, but he was still hooked up on life support. So he looked alive, but he was brain dead. And we had to make the decision to pull him off life support. You know, you would have thought that the man that had killed my mom and wanted me dead, that that would have been an easy decision. It, it just wasn't. He was my dad. We made the decision to pull him off, and uh, he died that night. Um, what happens when you die in prison is you're either buried on the prison grounds without any kind of service, or you can claim the body and have a normal funeral like normal people. And uh, through it all, we just said, you know what? He's still our dad, and we're not going to let him be buried in prison. So we claimed his body, and... Uh, we didn't have a lot of money at the time, and we actually had to borrow money from Marilyn's parents for a funeral. And uh, we decided to just bury my dad next to my mom because we already had a tombstone and a grave, and it was just cheaper, and we just wanted it to be over with. 
We had been through so many trials. My dad had had two. One of the men that had killed my mom has had four trials, each time a death penalty. The other guy got life. He's had two trials. We were just tired of it all. It had gone on for so long. We just wanted it to end. You would have thought that burying my dad next to my mom would have been a private family decision. It was not. <laughs> Media was not kind to us. Could not believe that we had done that. Um, they didn't offer to pay, <laughs> you know, but they couldn't believe we, that was a decision we made. But we, we had the service and we were done, we thought. And uh, the chaplain said, hey, Jim, the warden just called and he wants to allow a service for your dad inside the prison. He said, you don't understand, there's never been a service for an inmate, a funeral service for an inmate inside prison. And they want us to come. You and your brothers and wives are invited. We had no idea. We, 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 just, you know, we just were tired. <laughs> and we said, we'll do it, let's just get it over with. So Marilyn and I and Lewis and Gina and my other brother, Oscar, uh, headed to Huntsville. And hopefully none of you have been to Ellis Unit. But in, in Huntsville, but how it's set up, there's this long hall, and at this end is death row. And then there's a long hall, and all the dorms for general population are off of it. And at the end of the long hall is the chapel. It's called the Chapel of Life. So the warden thought it'd be a great idea to let us tour death row so we could see where dad lived. Don't do that again. <laughs> then, then you go through on the, the general population dorms, we saw that, and then we went right into the chapel. And I'm telling you, we were scared to death. This was Ellis Unit. And we sat down on the front row of the chapel, and we didn't turn around. We were scared. <laughs> and uh, the very first thing that happened was this men's chorus got up and started singing. And everybody in prison has a job. We found out that my dad had become the chaplain's assistant. And it's incredible what happens when you get your life right. Uh, God restored him, and he was the minister of music at the chapel. And he had started the first ever men's chorus at Ellis Unit. So we're like, okay. <laughs> so we listened to that. And then, one by one, about 300 men, one by one, would walk up to the podium, and they look at us, and they said, I became a Christian because your dad shared Christ with me. first one was overwhelming. When the 300th guy came up, it was extremely overwhelming. Because I learned it's one thing to say something when everybody's looking. <laughs> it's totally different to say something when nobody's looking. And when nobody was looking, my dad told a story of how he had come to know Jesus Christ, accepted him in his life, and had changed his life. And he had spent those last three years one-on-one -on -one telling men about Christ. Um, the service ended, and uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, I, I thought I had forgiven my dad that last year of, of uh, chatting with him, but my brothers and I, I think, and our wives, we left all that baggage at the prison gates. We let go of that. We had to make the choice to let go of it. Because you know what? Everybody I know that's been hurt, um, if you hold on to it, you become bitter, angry, depressed. I didn't want to be that guy. Um, you know, God tells us to forgive. And it's not so it gets the other person off the hook. It's so I get off the hook. It's so you get off the hook. If you let go of those bags, you get off the hook. Um, we left that day, and I, I thought I had... Um, truly forgiven, and about three years ago, uh, there's a program in Texas called the Texas Victim Offender Mediation Program, and I had obviously talked to my dad, and I also talked to one guy that was uh, involved in my mom's crime, but I had not actually met the man that had shot my mom, and I had the opportunity to do that. Um, so I went down to Beaumont, and... It's, there was like a little picnic table. <laughs> uh, excuse me, it was a, like a card table. And the guy's name is Charles Moore. And Charles Moore was on this side. I was here, and we had a mediator right beside me. I called him my bodyguard because <laughs> I was scared to death. <laughs> and I came face to face with the guy that had shot my mom. And turned out 
he said that he had become a Christian in prison. And I'll admit I was a little leery as well, but I listened to him, and um, he answered, because I'm an organized guy, I had my list of questions. He answered all my questions, but I'm going to tell you, I, I understood finally what it means to choose, because he was too honest. He told me way too much. Uh, He told me how my mom saved our lives. That apparently they were trying to find out where the boys were because they were supposed to kill my mom and myself and my two brothers. And she kept lying and saying they were with their dad and they knew that wasn't the case. So apparently it it took a lot longer for that process to happen with these two guys and my mom, and uh, she saved my life. And when he's telling me this, I am going to be so honest and transparent, I wanted to kill him. I was ready to reach over and strangle this old man. And I had to make a choice. You know, God gives us a way. I had to get up, and I physically walked away, went down the hall to a bathroom, got a little upset, And I came back and I confessed, I wanted to kill you. (laughs) And you know what? I bet I wouldn't have gotten in trouble. Uh, He wanted me to forgive him right then, and I couldn't do it. I was still carrying that bag. I waited a couple weeks, and I finally wrote him a letter, and I said, uh, Charles, I forgive you. And uh, it got me off the hook. Um, I was digging through some some stuff the other, not too long ago, because um, my mom, she was only 29 when she uh, was murdered, but she had had a couple of death threats on her life before then. She knew something was going to happen. She just didn't know exactly what was going on. Um, And at 29, in her safety deposit box, she had already had a will, and she already had her funeral written out. And she wanted one song sang at her funeral. And uh, bear with me, it's a, it's a 70 song, but it's called um, I'll Tell the World That I'm a Christian. And I'll just, I'm not going to sing, I'm just going to read it. <laughs> I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me everywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life brand new. And I know that you, if, you tr- if you trust him, that all he gave me, he will give to you. I'll tell the world that he's my savior. No other one could love me so. My life, my all is his forever, and where he leads me, I will go. I'll tell the world that he is coming. It may be near or far away, but we must live as if his coming would be tomorrow or today. For when he comes and life is over, for those who love him, there's more to be. Eyes have never seen the wonders that he's preparing for you and me. Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian. Be not ashamed his name to bear. Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian and take him with you everywhere. And I was really thinking about that a while back, and I'm thinking, you know what? What an example of my mom for us about forgiveness. She, she had already forgiven. And I, you know, and I, I thought if she could forgive facing death, and leave a message for my brothers and I that you just tell the story of how Jesus changed her life and forgive. If she could do it, I could do it. And um, it's been great for my brother, my brothers and I to explain to our kids how even though a horrible tragedy happened, God can still use it for good. You know, he, even though that happened, he still turned it for his good. Um, you know, but there were still consequences. You know, even though my dad became a Christian and Charles uh, Moore, the killer, had actually become a Christian, there were still consequences. They were going to have to serve the remainder of their life in jail. But you know what? God still used my dad. Um, I, uh, since then, uh, had the opportunity to become uh, part of a prison ministry. And I do that every week. And basically, it's a ministry where victims of crime are volunteers, and we go in with inmates, and we tell our story. 
And uh, it just reminds me of the, the, when that memorial service for my dad happened um, after they had all shared uh, the, the chaplain looked at me and said, Jim, would you like to say something? And I said, no. <laughs> but I said, yeah, okay. So I got up, and I turned around, and I saw 300 men in white jumpsuits. And I realized then I was no different than they were. They had just made some bad choices that got them there that I hadn't made. And the only thing I could tell them is they need now to go back into the dorms and general population and tell others about the Christ that was in them. We're supposed to tell the world. That's what we're supposed to do. And you know what? You can tell a lot better if you throw those bags away. Um, that's my story. Thanks for your time.